Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I am your host, David Delk. Our guest today is Sarah Higginbotham, Director of Environment Oregon. So welcome to the show, Sarah. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit about uh, Environment Oregon. Yeah, Environment Oregon is a um, statewide, citizen-based, that's the important part, environmental advocacy organization. And we have about 30,000 members statewide. And we aim to, really in a nutshell, protect the values we think most Oregonians share and the special places we all love. And then we want our policies in Oregon to reflect those values. So clean air, clean water, and special open places protected. Um, and then we do most of our um, influence and our ability to advocate successfully comes from people power, and so we're a grassroots organization. Okay, all right. And uh, you said 30,000 people in, in involved or members, so yeah. what, what counts you as a member? Yeah, so um, there are a few things. We actually have even more than that who are email activists, right, folks that are just part of our email and online community that take actions with us, whether it's contacting a legislator or um, you know sending us a photo of their favorite place so we can do some sort of cool media action with them but then an actual member is someone who um, is um, putting in I think it's about twenty five dollars a year twenty five to thirty five dollars a year um, to be a member of Environment Oregon and then we don't take any um, corporate dollars or any donations from corporations so that sustained support from the public allows us to go out and, and you know, advocate or lobby on behalf of the public's interest and the environment's interest. So. Uh, okay, great. Yeah. Okay. yeah and uh, h how do you typically get those members to be involved? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is probably one of the most compelling parts of being a part of Environment Oregon for me. Um, we are out there talking to the public almost every day of the year, and we do that um, by going out and knocking on doors and talking to people on the streets. And so, um, for example, this summer alone, when we have tons of activists and young folks coming in to work with us and help us do that citizen outreach, we'll aim to talk to about 60,000 people statewide. Wow. Um, and that face-to-face -face canvassing, door-knocking contact is one of the best ways to reach out to the public and engage um, people who are not only already politically interested, such as yourself, um, but people who might not otherwise have the time or the, the moment or the spare moment in a day to actually pick up the paper or, or sign online and do that sort of self-selection to get involved. So we're going out, we're educating them about issues. One, we're engaging them in signing petitions and speaking up on issues. And then finally, we're asking them to get involved in a meaningful way so that we can actually go represent them in D.C. or in Salem. Um, so we go out and do the hard work of talking to a lot of people to, to engage them, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that reaching out door to door is really much what makes Environment Oregon unique in terms of other environmental organizations? Absolutely. So um, I like to say we're the largest grassroots organization in the state in the environmental community because of that outreach alone. Running that operation um, is a whole lot of work, um, but it is so critical to bringing in, as I said, sort of new people into the process all the time. Um, I think too often um, the same sort of folks end up on the same list. Um, mm -hmm. for organizations, and one of the most exciting parts about this is engaging those new people. Right. Yeah, and, and I, I, you know, the reason I invited you here today was because one of your volunteers right. came and knocked on my door right. at home, and, and you know, I have contributed to the Environment Oregon for actually a long time. Thank you. But she was so engaging, I thought, well, why have I not reached out to Environment Oregon and asked them to be a yeah. guest on, on our program? So. Yeah, so, which uh, was thank perfect. you, Courtney, for coming. And she came back and she right. said, she followed right up and she was like, I talked to David and you got to do a show. And so that was great. Yeah, I couldn't be more proud of the um, the organizers that we bring in. And I think the other engaging part, I mean, there's so many, is just being able to bring in new people. And for so many of our canvassers, it's their first political experience that mm -hmm. they ever have. Um, and then we actually give them the tools and the skills that are just, I think, no matter how high you go in political advocacy or environmental advocacy, if you don't have those basic skills of how do you organize people and talk to people and tell a good story to um, compel people to action, um, you'll just never be as successful as you could be. So. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so I, I, I'm just going to ask you this yeah. because <laughs> you look so young to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and so how did you get into the position you're in? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm 30, um, and I, you know, I was saying it's so cool to be in the studio and to be part of community media. I actually initially got interested in journalism, so I focused on that. 
And then I um, was really interested in how do you tell a good and compelling story that's fact-based and meaningful to actually compel people to, to action and, and inspire them and then create a stronger community. And that was how I went at that for a long time. And I happened to also be politically active for quite a while. And then in 2008, I was inspired like so many folks I think were um, by the election that was happening. And I thought, you know, President, excuse me, then Senator Barack Obama was very cool. But what I thought was cooler, David, was his the organization he was running and his ability to mobilize all these new people to actually do something and get involved on a grassroots level. I was one of them. Um, and then in 2010, I had the opportunity to actually put aside my um, career in publishing and journalism and run a campaign in Oregon. And I thought, I can't think of anything else I would rather do. So I set out, I knocked on thousands of doors. I helped build a, one of the biggest grassroots campaigns in the state that year and um, was just totally inspired by that. And then fast forward to 2011, I became a lobbyist down in our state capital in Salem. And this is going to sound naive probably to you, but I wanted to see, I'd worked for these politicians, I wanted to see how policy actually came together. And I learned really quickly, it either happened in one of two ways. You either had a lot of money and you got things done down in the capital, mm -hmm. or you were really good at organizing people. And I had the great pleasure of working for some really great groups from disability rights issues to the Oregon Humane Society to renewable energy. And I thought, you know, there are a lot of groups that have the potential to be good at organizing people, and there are a few that are really good at it. So, um, you know, I actually walked into a representative's office that session, and that was the moment for me because I walked in, I said, well, I'd like to talk to you about HB, da 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 da, and he opened his file cabinet, and he reached and he pulled out a stack of letters, and he looked at me and goes, Sarah, I've already gotten 23 letters about this. You've got my vote. You're wasting my time. You can get out. And I was like, whoa. It's co the dot's connected. And uh -huh. I was like, you know, you kind of believe that that's the way it works. But, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it takes more. Sometimes it takes less. Right, yeah. And so then um, I looked around after that and thought, well, I want to merge my love and appreciation for grassroots organizing with actually making real policy happen. And I saw that the place that that was happening was one of the places was Environment Oregon. Mm -hmm. And the ability to do that grassroots outreach around is not only, um, I think, really meaningful and overall healthy for democracy, it's also a whole lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm really pleased that you think it's fun because I know a lot of people wouldn't think it was fun at all. So <laughs> you <laughs> so better. But, <laughs> but it is, it is what, uh, you know, what we yeah. uh, as individual people and as citizens need to be involved with mm -hmm. because uh, if we don't, then money speaks. That's it right. already speaks much louder than we do. Uh, we need to have many more people involved mm -hmm. in an active day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month, uh, uh, manner. So good, thank you. So you did have experience coming into this job. I, I did. Like, yeah. I was like, wow, you look so young. <laughs> you why you have enough experience to take on this position? Yeah. So I, I, I this think is it's great. The, yeah. the grassroots organizing. Uh -huh. They keep me. It keeps me young. So I think if everyone did it, they might all look <laughs> as young as I do. <laughs> all right. Good. All right. Yeah. So. Um, I know that Environment Oregon came out of Osberg, so talk about that just for a minute. Yeah, so um, Osberg is the Oregon State Public Interest Research Group, and that came out of the public interest movement back in the late 60s and 70s, as I know you know. And the whole idea was, um, you know, we were coming up against, in order to, you know, solve some issues, you go back to Ralph Nader and the days when he was trying to take on the car companies, right? Mm -hmm. And he came up against some of the most powerful ones there were and had this theory that if he could get the facts on his side and present them in a meaningful way in a research report and put on a suit and meet people, meet politicians where they were at and really represent the public, he could get something done. Oregon has a long tradition with that. Osberg is one of the oldest PERG chapters in the um, country. It started at the University of Oregon campus, my alma mater. And um, over the last 40 years, a huge chunk of the work that Osberg did in the name of public interest was environmental work because they're just inextricably linked. Mm -hmm. Clean air, clean water, making sure toxics aren't polluting um, the things that we need. So about six, seven years ago, Osberg decided that they would take the environmental work piece and separate that out into its own house for a whole set of reasons. One, Osberg does a whole bunch of other really great work that's not just environmental and that's largely what they're doing. Two, in creating Environment Oregon, we really thought that we could talk about the environment in a way and select the issues that would resonate most broadly with the most amount of people. And we really wanted to focus on that. And so I'm happy to report about six years later, I think we were right. And so I think we've been choosing the issues that we can get the most folks, most of the public on board with that are meaningful and profound and try and do that work. Great. 
So, uh, Sarah, talk yeah. about the projects or the campaigns that Environment Orient are involved with right now. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a, a broad mission, um, you know, clean air, clean water, and special places. So we try to be as strategic as we can about how we spend our time on which issues. The three main priorities for Environment Oregon right now are, one, our campaign to keep plastic out of the Pacific. Um, and we've been um, trying to turn off, really, the trash faucet in Oregon that's contributing to over 100 million tons of plastic garbage out in the um, Pacific Ocean. And we have come at that problem by looking at the um, overuse of the single-use plastic bag. So we use about 1.7 billion plastic bags that we don't even really need um, that are particularly harmful to wildlife, including sea turtles, sea otters, and other animals. Um, and with such an easy alternative, um, we see that as a big area that we can make a profound impact on. So that's, and we've made a lot of headway on that issue. That's one priority. The second priority that we're focused on is getting Oregon to build 250,000 solar roofs by 2025. So a quarter million quarter solar million. rooftops, right. mm -hmm. um, which would be about, um, that goal would be about 30 times as much solar as we have now and 10% and of our electricity needs in the next 13 years, 12 years. Is that is that uh, existing need or, or just 30% of the future needs? Future, so what we anticipate okay. would be would our be use at that point, yep. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third um, priority campaign we've been working on is a, a pretty ambitious and historic campaign to protect, um, expand and strengthen the protections for Crater Lake National Park, which is our only national park right now. Um, pretty shocking when you think about mm -hmm. what a beautiful mm -hmm. and green state Oregon is. So those are our three priorities. And then along with that, we're involved in a whole host of issues from um, other energy issues, energy efficiency issues, to um, a set of federal issues we prioritize. We aim to do most of our work um, on the state level, about 80%, and then we aim to do about 20% on the federal level to make sure that um, Oregon, as just an environmental leader out here on the West Coast, helps pushes, push the rest of the country mm -hmm. um, in the right direction and make sure that our leaders in D.C. Um, know that we've got their back on a lot of the stuff they're pushing for. Okay, good. So, so is Environment Oregon a part of a national organization or a network of Yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I should have mentioned that. So Environment Oregon is part of a 29-state federation, Environment America. And that, to me, is one of um, our huge strengths. What that enables us to do is, one, it means that we have a set of advocates in Washington, D.C. that... Um, you know, speak up for our interests, and really we want the dog wagging the tail. So we really, they're there to help the states accomplish um, what we need to do, and there are eyes and ears on the federal policy. And then um, the 29 other states is relevant in as so much as some states will lead on some issues and others will lead on others, and what that we can do is take lessons from the grassroots campaigns they're running and say, you know, that could work here, what did you do? And so it's a, it's a um, wealth of resources. And so that's really helpful as well. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah. So let, let, let's talk about the plastics. Yeah. I, a little more in depth. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I know that you, you talked about the major focus being on the on the single use plastic bags. Right. And we had some, you, we had some successes with that yeah. in the past couple of years. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So about, you know, we'll actually take a bigger step back. We have this enormous problem that I think for so long has been out of sight, out of mind. Um, it's enormous on the scale of, you know, I always compare it kind of to global warming. Here's this problem that is so huge and, and so hard to think about. How would we ever clean up or, or, you know, address this issue of over 100 million tons of garbage just in the Pacific, North Pacific gyre alone? Um, and, you know, so many people hear something like that and they're overwhelmed and so they're like, you know, you can do things. But you and I aren't those kinds of people and luckily there's a whole set of other people that actually want to be, um, you know, real solution oriented. And so what we wanted to do is bring a solution to the table that allowed us to engage folks in the issue, educate them, and start to just make meaningful and sort of easy change, one would think. And so that was where the plastic bag came in. We realized this was a huge problem from a wildlife perspective. Um, over a million seabirds in just plastic. The plastic bag in particular is just uh, incredibly, you think about the material of a plastic bag, challenging for wildlife. It actually looks like a jellyfish, and so um, sea turtles will see it, go after it for lunch, it never digests, it's got no nutrients, and then they starve. So 
And then what we'd also seen is over 80 governments around the world had actually already taken action on plastic bags in particular. So we saw that oh, momentum. So we're very late. <laughs> late to this Compared campaign. to some very countries, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so three years ago, Oregon um, decided to build momentum headed into the 2011 session. And we wanted to say, okay, what's the quickest way to do the most amount of good in the shortest amount of time? So we thought, let's ban those bags statewide. So we headed into um, the legislative session in 2011 with eight cities supporting a statewide ban, 500 businesses on board, 20,000 petitions and 20 organizations, all supportive. And we had collaborated um, with the Northwest Grocery Association who had joined our coalition supporting this. So we had both a broad coalition and a deep coalition. And we get in there and what do you know? Um, our good friends at the American Chemistry Council, <laughs> which you can imagine sounds uh, yes. you know, like a wearing white coats and doing the best of the um, public good. But actually, the American Chemistry Council represents Dow Chemical, ExxonMobil, um, and plastic bag manufacturers and plastics petrochemical companies, basically. And you can actually go to the Secretary of State's website and look up campaign contributions from the American Chemistry Council in 2010 headed into that session. Mm -hmm. And what you'll see is a spike in donations to chairs of committees right. and other legislators. And they also hired a team of well-heeled lobbyists, uh, well-connected lobbyists, and um, launched both a misinformation campaign in there and then just sort of used their might and money to block us by one vote from getting it out of the Senate. Um, so because we just value the resources we have, we sat back, analyzed our strategy, and said, is this something we should still spend time on? And looking at how much support we had, we talked to hundreds of thousands, we talked to over 200,000 Oregonians about this issue. We know they're with us. They think it's a common sense sort of solution um, to ban the bags and you know use alternatives. And um, we decided to start working locally, which is not um, a revolutionary trend, but um, was something that's sort of a tried and true method. We could get more done at the local level. And in the last year alone, the update is we've been able to ban plastic bags in three cities, two of Oregon's largest, Eugene and Portland. And then Corvallis is the third one. We were actually able to pass the first most progressive policy in Corvallis. And we estimate, based on the number of bags someone uses in a year, that we were able to eliminate about 350 million plastic bags from the waste stream in every year in just that one year. Wow. So we're now looking forward um, at what's next. And we think we need to go beyond the usual suspects of Portland and Corvallis and Eugene. I don't think anyone was too surprised that they mm -hmm. were the first people to do it. And so we're working with cities like Ashland in Southern Oregon, Bend in Central Oregon, and um, in Salem, the third largest city. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So uh, I understand the, uh, the reason for focusing just on plastic bags, yeah. but in terms of this plastic that's out there in the Pacific Ocean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of other plastics besides. There's diapers, there's pen caps, there's um, packing material that falls off cargo ships. Um, you know, a gray whale, in, it was 2010, a gray whale washed up on the shore of Puget Sound. And when they went in and did an autopsy on that whale, what they found in its stomach was everything from sweatpants to golf balls to 20 plastic bags, just an immense amount of trash. And, you know, w again, it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. But when you do start to talk to people about it, most folks agree, nothing that we use for just a few minutes, especially the plastic bags, like the worst culprit, um, should end up in the belly of a whale. Um, so it's a whole mixture of plastics. We think if we can start with the dialogue around the plastic bag, um, we think everybody, even my folks, who aren't the most environmentally <laughs> conscientious folks, they've got reusable bags in their car, uh -huh. um, that we can rally enough support around that and start to have a larger conversation down the road. Great, right, great. Right. You brought a sample. Yeah. Show us the sample. I did. This sample is um, a sample from a really wonderful organization here, I'll mix it up for you, called the Five Gyres Institute. And they um, actually go out and do expeditions into some of the world's gyres, which are big spinning currents where the currents all come together, and collect samples. They actually were kind enough to send us three. And what you'll see here is really more like a toxic soup. That's what we've called it. Um, plastic doesn't biodegrade. It actually photodegrades. And so all these tiny pieces are what happens to plastic over time. Scientists tell us that they don't really know um, if or when it would go away. Mm -hmm. And you know the really um, discouraging part is that what we're now seeing in Oregon is that we're sort of a sink for some of this plastic to wash back up on our shores. So microplastics, teeny tiny pieces, are actually washing back up on Oregon's beaches and up at Crescent Beach um, in Ecola State Park. One scientist sifted out about half a pound of microplastics from just a three foot by three foot oh. square. So we know that it's 
once it's gone, once we think it's gone, it's it's never really, mm -hmm. never really gone. Mm -hmm. Just totally, uh, this is yeah. not something you talk about. Yeah. I'm just, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking of Fukushima and the yeah. nuclear. Yeah. Uh, I presume that this area where the plastics are concentrated uh, would also be a potential site where nuclear waste would also concentrate. Plastics uh, are, yeah. once they're out there, they are basically a sponge for toxins, and so we know that once, basically, once they start to make their way out there, nothing good comes of it, and they absorb a ton of toxic um, chemicals, and then, you know, the smaller they get, the more they work their way up the food chain. We don't yet know what that will do. Yeah, right, okay, yeah. So let's move, move yeah. from there, because we're, our, our time is getting short. Yeah. Talk about the uh, quarter million solar roofs that you have as a goal. As a, yeah, um, I would love to. Goal. I think it's um, extremely exciting, um, again, to sort of take a step back and look at the big picture enough sunshine rains down all over the entire world in one hour, and you might know this, to power the entire world's population needs for a year. So the, the sun generates just an enormous amount of energy that we have not even begun to tap into. And when you look at uh, the job we're doing in Oregon and harnessing that clean power that never runs out and doesn't pollute, we're not doing so great. In fact, we get less than 1% of our energy in Oregon from solar power. Um, and so the time is right for a whole set of reasons for the solar community and other communities and the environmental community to rally around all this great potential. So we released a report, Solar Works for Oregon, um, last summer, and we actually wanted to look at the capacity and potential for Oregon to go big on solar. And what we found was that based on the growth rates we saw in places, solar leaders like California and New Jersey, that Oregon could actually get to about 10% of its electricity needs met from solar power by 2025. And then we translate that into a way that people can think about it in a way that we think is really important for folks to engage in sort of this clean energy movement, and that's with rooftop solar. Um, so that's the goal we've set. We came up against some big roadblocks down in Salem this session in trying to achieve some of the big goals we set. We were able to protect a very little bit um, and it was an important victory of a solar policy. We have our pilot feed-in tariff program, but we have so much further to go. Um, and so this is just an exciting campaign. And I guess the last thing I'll say about this, um, of course we have other questions, but is that solar in Oregon works in the rainy parts of the state, it works on the coast, and it has the potential to bring together um, you know, leaders and legislators who maybe are more conservative in the eastern parts of the state where it's sunny, or southern Oregon where it's more sunny. So I just think the potential for this is huge. And I, I, I know you're focused on the environment, but I, I yeah. assume in advocating for these policies that you also are, are cognizant and, and advance the, the obvious fact that solar creates a tremendous number of jobs. Absolutely. So um, solar, we chose the campaign name Solar Works for Oregon for that reason. Uh -huh. Oregon ranks the first study that was ever done on um, national study that put all the data on solar jobs together in one study just came out from the Solar Energy Foundation. and. Oregon ranks sixth in the country for solar jobs, hmm. yet we rank um, far lower, and the number states in there, I believe it's like 30th, forgive me if that's wrong, far, far lower in actually solar power homes. Um, so we have five to six, the estimate is 5,000 to 6,000 solar powered homes, really, which is very tiny. Um, so by doing this, we think we can create thousands more jobs and um, sort of bolster an economy and tell a really great clean energy job about producing our own energy in the state. So, in 30 seconds, yeah. what would you recommend Citizens of Oregon doing right now to advance any of your campaigns? Um, the most important thing they can do is take action at some level and speak up. So, the, the number one thing that's going to influence our elected leaders to take action is to hear from their constituents because I can guarantee you, and I know for a fact, they're hearing from the American Chemistry Council and the plastic bag companies from out of state, and they're hearing from the uh, big utility companies, big and small in the state, about why they shouldn't move forward on solar and why they shouldn't move forward on stopping ocean pollution. So the best thing they can do, they can always go to our website to find more information, but the best thing they can do is write a letter, make a phone call, or show up at a hearing um, and voice their opinion so that their elected officials can hear them. Thank you so much, yeah, Sarah. Yeah, thanks. Okay, and I hope that you'll come back because I know we've got <laughs> a lot more to talk about. I hope so. Okay, great. Thanks. Good, good. So. Uh, our guest today has been Sarah Higginbottom, uh, Director of Environment Oregon. Learn more about Environment Oregon at environmentoregon.org.
and check their action page at environmentoregon.org slash action. Don't forget that you can watch Populist Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows and to subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, many of you can ex help us expand our, our viewership. Just contact your local cable access station and see what is required for you to sponsor a weekly broadcast of our program. Most local stations are looking for good material and welcome the, su the suggestion and they can pick up the program at no cost to them from pegmedia.org. Populist Dialogues is a project of the Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and about our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. We want to thank our crew today who volunteer their time to get our program on the air. So thank you to Roger Bates, Dave King, Joan Horton, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And thanks to all of you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.